Hello everybody, and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope you're doing well, and today I'll be doing a review of the OG Godzilla, the original Japanese Godzilla film from 1954. Before going into this review, though, please be sure to smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching on Odyssey, and make sure that you are subscribed to the channel with that bell notification turned on, no matter what platform you happen to be watching from. So... Just the other day, yesterday, I was able to watch for the first time in my life Godzilla 1954. It's a movie that's been recommended to me by several people, including Empress of the Universe, Tina B, who is, of course, one of the mods and one of the Valkyrie on the channel for the live shows. And I have to say this, I was not really a big fan of this movie, and I think I can pretty much say that the kaiju genre really isn't one for me. And I'm not trying to say that this is necessarily a terrible movie or that this is a movie that you can't possibly ob objectively like. What I am saying is that this is just not really in the wheelhouse of films that I would typically find myself enjoying because there are a lot of various issues with how it is shot, with some of the acting styles and some of the visual effects that are seen in the film. Though I will absolutely give credit where credit is due that many of these visual effects are indeed a revolutionary for the time and that this indeed set the way and really paved the way for not just future Godzilla films, but also a lot of other disaster type movies as well with a lot of the things that they ended up doing forward with uh, with the genre and being able to push the genre forward in this capacity. So the original Godzilla film deals indeed with the introduction to the character of Godzilla. And much like we see in modern day Godzilla films, which is always interesting because whenever I have critiqued in the past, whether it's Godzilla King of the Monsters or Godzilla vs. Kong, a lot of people call me out and, and try and point out saying, well, that's just the kaiju genre. That, you know, that's just this and that's just that. And you were expecting to have a good story in there. You know, what are you talking about? The focus should be on the monster. Well, here's a movie right here that started everything off. And you have here a human story that takes front and center. You have, comparatively to the rest of the story, minimal uh, destruction, minimal uh, visual effects, uh, compared to the actual human characters shown in the film, which is very similar to what we see in the modern day world. The difference, I would say, is that at the very least, the story being told here is just a little bit more interesting than what we find in modern day movies. And the acting, except for one uh, exception, is significantly better than anything that we've seen in modern day Godzilla movies. And so it's just interesting to me that a lot of people try and act as if they know more about the kaiju genre and that therefore I should just shut my mouth. And yet here is the very first film in the genre and a lot of the same issues that have been either addressed or not been addressed are very much the same as they are today. I don't know. I just found that a bit interesting. But going into the film itself, as it says, in the film, Japanese authorities deal with the sudden appearance of a giant monster whose attacks trigger fears of a nuclear holocaust during post-war Japan. And so you find out throughout the course of the film that there had been much H-bomb underwater testing and that they likely, uh, the testing that is, freed some area of the underground underwater uh, areas that had been basically sealed from the crustacean period on, and that likely is where Godzilla came from. And what I found interesting about this movie is that I had no idea that in this OG film, Takashi Shimura, who is the lead film in Ikiru, and a couple of other, several other, in fact, he was uh, at least a role in several other Akira Kurosawa movies, uh, was actually in the film as one of the lead scientists. And I was really happy to see him because he is a fantastic actor. The one actor who I mentioned previously who I didn't think did a, did a good job and who kind of bothered me was the one who had invented, the, the, the one man who was missing one eye, and he was the one who invented the oxygen deleter, the oxygen, uh, you know, eraser, whatever it is that it was called. And I, I really felt like his performance was really campy because he, he's playing this doctor who has invented this new technology, which he fears will be weaponized if it's used. It's the only technology that exists that could potentially uh, actually be able to defeat Godzilla because nothing else is able to kill him. And so this oxygen eraser will not just make him, you know, suffocate underwater, but also will have his entire, you know, flesh essentially evaporate and leave not even bones behind in, in this capacity. And, and the performance that he's giving when he's trying to explain kind of the the situation that he's in and the struggle he's going through felt very ham-fisted and just really didn't 
I don't think it really read very well. While the rest of the performances in the film I thought were very well done, I thought were very good, and were pretty much what I would expect from a lot of the Japanese cinema that I have watched, there, there was just that one character that kind of just bothered me uh, for that very reason. Let me see if I can try and, and point him out a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so uh, Akihiko Hirata, who played Dr. Dasuki uh, Serizawa. Again, his performance there, maybe if you needed a, a face... Uh, to remember, just, again, was a little bit ham-fisted, where, as you had with the lead performance here by Akira Takarada, I thought he did a pretty good job. I thought the lead woman in the film, uh, uh, Momoko Kochi, also did a pretty great job. And then, of course, uh, Takeshi Shimura uh, always does great work in anything that he does. Now, the big thing, of course, with this film, specifically, is not going to be the story or the acting, but it's going to be the actual visual effects. And I will say, I really don't think the visual effects have aged all that well. And that's another one of the issues that I have with this movie. And again, I know it's 1954, I know that this is kind of an innovation of the genre, especially with the use of where it says here, Godzilla pioneered a form of special effects called suitmation, in which a stunt performer wearing a suit interacts with miniature sets. Principal, to principal photography lasted 51 days, and special effects photography lasted for 71 days. So obviously this is a, a pioneering of a new form of filmmaking, a new form of special effects, and I will absolutely give them credit for that, but there's just several moments in the movie where I honestly feel like it would have been better for us not to have seen the monster. I really feel that this, that this movie could have really benefited from that, that level of suspense, that level of buildup, that level of not actually seeing what's being presented. Now, obviously, they were very proud of this effect. They, they obviously were very proud of this innovation, and so they wanted to try and show it off and see what they could do with it. But I think just watching it through the modern day lens, even though I'm someone who typically really much enjoys old school effects, for instance, uh, Buster Keaton is probably one of the best uh, stunt artists that ever lived, and he was making silent films back in like the 1920s. So to say that this is me looking through modern lenses and, and really you know, tearing it up for that very reason, I just don't think is an accurate thing to say. What I am saying is that we can look back, even though we're looking through this 2021 lens, we can look back at these films and we can look at them for what they are at the time. Again, showing respect to this pioneering of a new form of special effects, but we can also be critical of those effects and say they probably really aren't that effective. They really aren't as effective as maybe they could have been. They could have done what they did just a little bit better. And again, I think building up that suspense of not showing the person in the, clearly the person in the monster suit, and there are several points where it's just, it's almost campy, and it's not trying to be campy, or at least it doesn't come across as campy in the way that it's being presented, and so it kind of just leads to this, 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 uh, this, this, this almost this unity, this disruption of the flow of the film. You have the, these ca characters on screen who are doing great acting, great work, and they are just, you know, in fear of their lives with what's going on. And then all of a sudden, there's just this head that pops up above a mountain, and it's, again, clearly a guy in a suit, and it's like, um, okay. And then at the end of the movie, you have underwater Kong, or sorry, an underwater Godzilla, and then the actors that are supposed to be underwater... And then they show them, and it's clearly them not underwater. And the f the effects that were used at the time, I just I, I just don't think it conveyed what they were trying to get across with the movie. If it seems like I'm being too harsh with this movie, um, again, I'm not trying to be. I'm just, as I always say, I give my honest opinion on this channel. I don't sugarcoat anything for any studio or for any individual person or for any audience because I'm going to be honest with what I think about all of these things. And I really honestly think that because of these various issues that it was very difficult for me to enjoy this movie and all of the objectively good elements that were present, that were there. And obviously there were some pretty interesting special effects. I thought the use of light to show radiation, I thought that was done pretty well. I thought a lot of the miniature scenes were also obviously very innovative for the time and a really cool way of showing it. But there were just several moments where because they just didn't film it in a way to make it look cinematic or or it was just because they were showing it a little bit too much or maybe it was lit too well, it just really did feel like there was just some dude in a suit walking around destroying miniature sets and not a portrayal of the 1950s innovation of suitmation in the way that it's being presented here. It's just the way, again, I personally perceived it. So overall... 
Again, I think there are some good elements to this original film, but I can pretty much say that, you know, Godzilla or Gojira, whatever it is that you want to call it, uh, the first film of the kaiju genre, really, of 1954, directed by Ishiro Honda, really just is not my cup of tea. It's just really not a film uh, that I think is, is, is made for me as modern day people have it said it. So if I had to give this film a grade, I'm going to be gracious with it. I'm going to give it a B minus. I, I honestly think that my enjoyment of this film probably would realistically drive the score a lot lower but I will indeed give I think a few points here because the film was made in the 1950s and because this was an innovation of a new technology that um, obviously that's something that I'm going to uh, keep into account here so I'm gonna give this film a B minus but I'm gonna be honest I really have no desire to watch any of the other films in this series and it was kind of fun being able to watch this movie because I remember some sequences I remember the whole thing with the oxygen eraser I remember uh, Godzilla at the very end of the film actually dying like I remember these uh, images from my childhood because there were times that you know the various Godzilla films Films would be on and I would just basically have them on in the background with the really terrible English dubs and when I was younger I obviously had no idea that they were English dubs I, I just assumed that they were all speaking English and obviously looking back on it you realize oh the mouth is not matching up here with the voice but seeing this with the Criterion Collection release of the film with the subtitles and being able to enjoy the performances for what they were and being able to see this innovation of technology Again, just really didn't uh, hit it out of the park for me personally. So overall, I'd be minus. What are your thoughts about the movie, though? Obviously, I know many of you are going to disagree with me on this one. But again, I think that talking and calling out things like the ham-fisted acting of the one-eyed doctor or the visual effects just really not holding up or building suspense. I even at certain points got bored with the movie and, and even fell asleep where I had to actually rewind it and rewatch it. So that was just the way in which the film was was received by me. Uh, from my own subjective point of view. But what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comment section below. And also, if you like this video, make sure you smash that like button, light up that fire button. If you're watching over on Odyssey, you're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless. Now for a huge shout out to all of my June Patreon and subscribe star members, Andrew Hoyle, Biffer de Hobbit, Brian P, Dion, Don Bruno de la Mancha, Enrique Evangelista, Father Christopher Miller, hail to you, Father, Father Damian Cook, Garrett Searles, Inflamed Wood, It's a Trap Productions, Jason Clark, Jacob Juice, Jeffrey Toon, Jonathan Carney, Laura, the Modern Major General's story, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mr. Peabody and his evil twin with the beautiful hair, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Riff Magos, Rosetta Allen, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, and rather Teresa Martin is Miss Martin Muses now, Tina Bojan, Tina B., and Washington Madranda. Thank y'all very much for being my supporters on Patreon. And to my subscribe star peeps, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, Stand For, John B., Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss slash the new number two, J. Ra, the beer guru, Nevanon G. Adams, and ZK Man. Thank you all very much for being my subscribe star members. And if you want your name shouted out at the every at the end of every video and live stream, please consider joining on Patreon or Subscribe Star. You also get access at other tiers to things like a bi-monthly podcast, bi-monthly, bi -weekly weekly, twice a month podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger, which is a lot of fun. There's also a tier in which you can join me once a month for the Chosen of Valhalla live stream where you all get to at that level, join me for discussions, talk about any projects that you might be working on, or just hang out and have a good time. It's a lot of fun. And also, too, for many of those levels, you also get access to a giveaway section on the Discord server where you get access to giveaways of things like 4K movies, digital codes, and tons of other stuff like that. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out the links in the description and sign up over on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and as always, God bless.